This video looks at prediction structures for optimal predictive control. The previous video then emphasized that the key weaknesses of GPC are based on the use of finite horizons. And in order to assume a well-posed optimization, you need to include a class of predictions which converge asymptotically, that is not in finite time. Now this class of predictions must also include the global optimum. And we have accepted that the definition of the global optimum is to some extent arbitrary, but we will give a definition because we need this. Now typically, the community uses a two-norm measure in order to define optimum, and that two-norm measure is taken over infinite horizons. So what's the definition of the global optimum? The optimum is defined as the control trajectory which minimizes the following performance index. <coughs> now, in general, you may not use both of these input terms, but that's <coughs> not a central issue at the moment. For a linear system, the corresponding control trajectory and indeed control law is well defined in the literature, and that's quite important. So what we're saying is if you, if you define global optimum using a performance index a bit like this, then the solution for the optimum control law is well known. Now, for convenience, this chapter is going to use state space models. The reason we're going to do that is if you try and use transfer functional Karima models, you tend to find that the algebra is somewhat cumbersome, but it doesn't actually add anything useful to the insight or the concepts. Linear quadratic regulators. Now, optimal control is a standard topic in most control curricula. So if I take a simple state space model, there it is, xk plus 1 equals axk plus buk, and I use an infinite horizon performance index, where for now, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the target is 0. So there's my performance index, the sum from k equals 0 to infinity, xk plus 1 transpose qxk plus 1 plus uk transpose ruk. Then the optimal control law is given by this uk equals minus kxk, where you've got these various expressions here telling you how k is defined in terms of things like r, b, a, and q. So that's well known. The other thing is, if you want to find out what this compensator, this feedback is, k, then indeed you can use MATLAB and use a command something like this, dlqr, a, b, q, and r. Now you're going to get to a key point. What is the point of predictive control? I've just told you that using an equivalent performance index to the one used with predictive control, I can tell you, by definition, the global optimal control law. So if the optimal control law can be solved so simply, why on earth would I want predictive control in the first place when predictive control is in fact a sub-optimal alternative? Well, the answer to this is actually for constraint handling. And although you might find this ironic, I want you to put that to one side for now, and we're going to revisit constraint handling later. But just remember that the key point of predictive control is for constraint handling, and so what we're trying to do in this chapter is set up a well-posed problem for when we introduce constraint handling later. Predictive control with a class of optimal predictions. So what we've said is the linear quadratic regulator, using that as a base to give us the optimal pre predictions, then what we've got is a combination of your model, there it is, x equals ax plus bu, and an optimal feedback, u equals minus kx, and that will give you the global optimal behavior in the case that the target is zero. Now, if you combine these two together, what you find is your optimal predictions are given by this equation here, xk plus 1 equals a minus bk times xk. And the key thing is it's known. So taking that model, I can form the predictions. So here we go. You'll see the predictions for the state are given by phi xk, phi squared xk, phi to the n xk, and so on down. And I can summarize this as some matrix p subscript x times xk. In a similar way, given that u equals minus kx is our control law, then clearly I can find the global optimum input trajectory, and it's minus kxk, minus k phi xk, and so on down, minus k phi to the n minus 1xk, and so on. 
and that I can write as some matrix PU times the state XK. And here's an interesting point. There is no flexibility in these predictions. They're fixed. The optimal predictions are known. And you're then thinking, well, if the optimal predictions are known, there's no optimization left. I've already done it. So how can I influence the choice of the current control move? And the thing now is we want to add some degrees of freedom in order to create a class of predictions. At the moment, we've just got a single prediction. It's not a class. The prediction is what you're given. But we want to have some class over which we can do an optimization. We need some degrees of freedom within our predictions which can be deployed to improve behavior. Now, don't worry about the fact I've got improve there because you're thinking, just a minute, I've already said this behavior is the global optimum. How can I make it better? But again, this will relate back to constraints. Now, so far, we've defined only the optimal LQR predictions for a zero set point. The easiest degree of freedom to add is some flexibility in the choice of the input, and here's the key thing, only over immediate transients. Now, this is a pragmatic decision because that's easy to handle. Now, the other reason we might want to do that is because it's usually the immediate transients where our decision making is focused. If you think of yourself as a human and think about the sort of decision making you make, you have a fairly vague idea about what you're going to do in the long term, but a much more precise idea about what you're going to do immediately. And therefore, the degrees of freedom you need, or where they're most important, are in immediate transients. And you'll see the sort of caveat is as long as we know that the long term is known to be safe and sensible. So how do we add degrees of freedom to our LQR predictions? What we want to do is add some flexibility to just the first few control moves within these predictions, the predictions you get from deploying an LQR feedback. And that's what I've done here. You remember the optimum predictions for U future were given by this term here. So we basically said it's minus k x k at sample k or minus k x k plus 1 at sample k plus 1 and so on. And what we're going to do is add a perturbation term, c k at time k, c k plus 1 at time k plus 1. And we're going to go down and we're going to do n c of these. So that's our immediate transients. And beyond that, we're going to assume there's no perturbations. So we combine this feedback, tool, feedback law now with our model equation. So we already had our default feedback, and we've now added some perturbations. And we want to ask ourselves, what's this going to do to the state predictions and the input predictions? So there's our underlying model, xk plus 1 equals axk plus buk. I've added this control law, and what you actually end up with is for the first nc steps, your prediction model is this one here, xk plus 1 equals phi xk plus bck, and you remember that phi was defined as a minus bk. And then once you go beyond the first nc steps, and you're no longer adding these perturbation terms, you just get xk plus 1 equals phi xk. So now we have our prediction model, which depends on our initial state xk, and our perturbation terms ck. We can use the model and compensator equations then recursively to determine the following predictions. So the future state predictions are going to be given by this term here. And you remember this term is just what you get if you use only the LQR feedback. So we already know that. And then you end up with this additional term, which depends on the perturbations that you've added. And I'm going to write this in a compact sense as px times xk. So there's your unconstrained LQR predictions. And then you've got some matrix hc times your a vector of your future perturbations. Now, in a similar way, I can find my input predictions. And you'll find the input predictions have the LQR bit, the pu xk, and then some matrix hu times the future perturbations. So the key thing here is I've added some degrees of freedom to my predictions because those degrees of freedom give me flexibility to change the predictions should I need to, should it be advantageous to do so. What's an optimal 
MPC algorithm then, and we often call this OMPC for short for Optimal MPC. What we're going to do is take the predictions based around the implementation of an LQR regulator and some perturbation terms. And that was summarized here. <coughs> you can see the predictions have a dual mode part where for the first NC steps you take your state feedback minus KXK and add a perturbation term and then beyond that your control law is your LQR feedback. And what we're going to do is optimize our predicted performance with respect to these perturbations C. These are the degrees of freedom we've given ourselves. So that's how we're going to optimize performance and obviously implement just the first value CK. So what we're doing is we're minimizing our infant horizon performance index which we've given there and we're optimizing it with respect to these perturbation terms, this C future term. Now an aside, this prediction structure is actually called dual mode prediction because there are two clearly distinct dynamics one for the transients and one for asymptotic behavior so if you see I've spread it out a bit here if you look at this particular part here you'll notice that's the transient mode that's what you're going to do for the first NC steps and then if you look at the other part you'll see that's the terminal mode which is your asymptotic behavior which is what you get after NC steps. And if you look in the literature, you'll find people often talk about this concept of dual mode, and that's all that they mean. You've got something that you do for the first so many steps, and something else that you do asymptotically. Some observations then about this OMPC approach. Now, by definition, for the unconstrained case, and that's quite important for the unconstrained case, the optimal value of the future inputs minimizing J is given by your LQR feedback, UK equals minus K XK. Now this means that in the unconstrained case, and I keep emphasizing that the unconstrained case, the optimal value for the future input perturbation CK has to be zero and you might be thinking this is all a bit bizarre you've added something which you know to be zero what's the point but we'll get to that eventually consequently it's easy to show that if you combine these predictions with this performance index and you then calculate the corresponding J that is you substitute these predictions into this performance index and go through all the algebra what you'll find is the performance index is some function of XK which you cannot change because that's the current state, plus CK transposed SCK, or the sum of all those terms. Now, why is that interesting? Number one, it's simple and well conditioned because you see you've just got the sum of squares of these CK terms with some S term in between. And the other thing, if it's not obvious, is it tells you, therefore, that the optimum CK is zero. So a summary. In order to produce the desired closed loop behavior, the class of predictions should include the desired closed loop behavior. And maybe that's rather obvious. If your predictions are based on perturbations around the optimal LQR regulator, then this can be achieved. So it's a simple mechanism, this, of achieving what you want. The dual mode predictions implicitly evolve over an infant horizon, so they only converge asymptotically, um, and that's what you wanted. The optimization is now well conditioned, and in fact, the optimum for the uncontrolled case will always be CK equals zero. Um, and the optimization at each sample will also give the same results as the previous sample in the normal case, which emphasizes that the optimization is well posed. So what this means is you will not keep changing your mind. If you look back at what we discussed in the previous chapter at GPC, it chose an optimum trajectory now, and then you got to the next sample, and you ended up with a different optimum trajectory, so you kept changing your mind so the problem wasn't well posed. If you look at this OMPC approach, what you'll find is that whatever decisions you take now, when you get to the next sample, it will give you the same decision again, obviously, in the nominal case. So you've got a well-posed optimization, everything works well, and now you're quite happy.